Welcome to yet another session on digitally controlled power converters. My name is Rana Jay Malik and I am from ST Microelectronics Noida. In this session, I will walk you through how to practically address the design of high power LLC converters using a mix of analog and digital hybrid control as well as a full digital control scheme with a very wide output range. I hope after these sessions, the viewers would be confident enough to start working hands on with high powered LLC converters. In fact, as the sessions progress, we will walk you through uh, two designs, one 2.5 kilowatt design and another 6 kilowatt design, which has been developed from scratch here in our lab in Noida. And we will walk you through uh, the key waveforms, the key characteristics, uh, and physically we will demonstrate to you how the board works under both hybrid as well as digital control, so that you will be able to have a first hand view of how real life high power LLC converters work and we are sure and we also hope that you would start working on high power converters with much more confidence and a head start that you should get from following this course. So let's proceed. In this particular episode, we will cover uh, four key aspects of LLC converter design. For example, if we have to look at LLC converter realization in great detail, we have to cover four aspects invariably. So that means any LLC converter design depends on the power plant design, the modulator design, the feedback management and overall protection schemes that we have put in place. The power plant is the most important block here that is the most visible block and the block that is subjected to a lot of stress. So this includes the input filter capacitors, uh, the input bridge. Uh, which is the either half bridge or the full bridge MOSFET or the IGBT or the uh, SIC MOSFET stage. Uh, then we have the resonant tank. Uh, the resonant tank is the most important part of the energy transfer block of the uh, power plant. So that includes the resonant capacitor, the resonant inductor and the, and the main transformer. Then we reach to the secondary side. The secondary side would house would have the main rectifiers. It can be either discrete uh, diode rectifiers in half bridge uh, a half wave or full wave configuration or it could be also uh, synchronous rectification using MOSFETs to reduce the losses and then we would have the output filters uh, those also carry a lot of stress the output filter capacitors must be suitably rated for you know having a very low ESR and having a wide uh, temperature range so that it doesn't degrade uh, during service so once the power plant has been realized and characterized we have to next move on to the modulator the modulator is that block which provides the pulse frequency modulated signals, provides the requisite dead time, uh, contains the error amplifier which, which takes input or the information from the feedback management system and tells the power plant at which frequency to operate so that the regulation of the output current or the output voltage is maintained. Then we have the feedback management block. The feedback management block is nothing but uh, the output sampler stages because if you are developing a constant voltage output, we would need to sample the output voltage which is which is at an acceptable level for the error amplifier if we are doing a constant current source we would also need to take the output current sample uh, and if we are doing for example a battery charger which needs a constant voltage constant current system then it is imperative to take the feedback from both the output current and the output voltage now the output signal might have a lot of noise uh, the error amplifier must receive a noiseless sample of the output. So it is very important to properly buffer the output signal samples. So that means we might use a resistive divider, we might use the shunts, but everything that is done must be properly buffered, must be properly routed so that we don't pick up noise in the process and we feed a clean signal back to the error amplifier so that it's able to direct the modulator and the power plant in a proper manner. And finally, we need to have a lot of protections. There are some inherent protections that every converter must be provided with. For example, an LLC converter must never operate in the capacitive zone. For example, an LLC converter during startup 
must have a proper startup sequence because during startup the output capacitors are short circuited and the feedback loop would force the power plant to work at a frequency much lower than resonance which would cause it to fail and destruct so these inherent protections must be a very essential feature of the llc controller or of the overall system control or the modulator and these things have to work together so that the startup or the shutdown of a high power converter is done in a proper mat manner to prevent catastrophic failure then we would also need to figure out how to prevent eventual fault events like for example output short circuit input over voltage output sudden load disconnects so any sort of anomalous operations that can happen must be properly taken care of in the form of derating or in the form of system shutdown so that catastrophic failures leading to expensive repairs do not happen we must also take care of the thermal issues and we must also take care of uh, providing sufficient protection for the system to work unattended so that means the system must be able to either fall back or shut down or go into such a safety mode such that despite what happens due to any external trigger or due to anomalous conditions in the mains or due to anomalous conditions in the load the system must never fail so all these things come under the control of the main system controller which can be either uh, designed using traditional analog methods using discrete circuits or can be totally implemented using the digital control blocks using a microcontroller so we will as we as we proceed we will see all these features and how that is implemented the most important uh, aspect for designing the magnetics of an llc converter for example is the gain curve we will not go into too much details on the details of how to uh, derive the gain curves but we uh, we have already we, we are already aware of the fact that the lc tank circuit gain curves are a deciding factor on how to address the operating range of the llc converter for example if you are working on a very wide output range llc converter it is very important to choose judiciously the portion of the gain curve where my llc converter would be operating because wide output range llc converters because by virtue it's a pulse frequency modulated scheme the output voltage is a function of the operating frequency if i need a very high operating voltage then my operating frequency must be very low if my operating frequency is very low and if i am entering boost mode i have to be very careful that i don't enter the capacitive mode similarly if i want very low voltages i have to increase the frequency that means i have to move away from resonance deep into the inductive zone in this case my losses would also increase so we have to find a trade off in the operating gain curve in the in the in the typical gain curve of the lc tank so that we have a trade off between the operating frequency excursion and how much voltage span we are able to achieve so we will show you later on that in certain cases it is possible to also target or also achieve a 1 in 1 is to 5 voltage span by using certain scheme that we will demonstrate subsequently in some chapters we will finally show you uh, a real time demonstration in the lab of a 2.5 kilowatt light electric vehicle battery charger which is a mix of uh, analog and digital control we we call it the hybrid control so we will show you in real time how the system behaves uh, we will show you in real time uh, the tank current the gate drive waveforms and we will also show you depending on the operating condition how the mcu sends the control signals to the main modulator and how the tank characteristics change Uh, the tank current the operating frequency the output voltage how that changes in response to commands received from the microcontroller so moving on we are all aware that llc converters is very well known for its high efficiency and uh, hence a very low emi content due to soft switching and uh, simple modulation scheme uh, we use pulse frequency modulation instead of pulse width modulation so basically here the duty cycle remains very close to 50% symmetric duty cycles 50% plus 50% for the two arms and uh, we vary the frequency of the uh, wave for to provide regulation of the output voltage or the output current like i mentioned earlier there are four characteristic dimensions uh, which must be addressed together first of all is the power plant design so once we have chosen the topology whether it is half bridge or full bridge once we have chosen the magnetics in the tank after thorough calculation 
once we have selected the proper switches and the rectifiers it is possible to first make uh, the, the power pcb or the power part separately on uh, a properly laid out circuit board and independently test the power plant all that it takes is a suitable set of gate drivers and the power plant ready and a signal generator to generate the frequency span of interest this way you will be able to characterize the power plant and debug it before you start applying uh, either the analog control or the digital control to finally work the system in closed loop we must also have or we must also pay significant attention to the modulator design for example the modulator can be either analog we will show in some subsequent slides how an analog modulator and a digital modulator behaves so the modulator basically contains of the vco uh, vco is the voltage controlled oscillator which eventually generates uh, the square wave pulses the vco gets its gets uh, its information from the output voltage sampler and the error amplifier then we have the phase shifter so basically the phase shifter uh, generates 280 degree uh, phase shifted outputs for driving the two arms of the llc uh, converter we have the dead time generation we will see uh, in later slides that the dead time is very important for ensuring high efficiency and zero voltage switching for which the llc converter is well known for over the entire load span so insufficient dead time can be a cause for losing efficiency and sometimes even destruction of the system and not one single dead time setting is good for entire operating range over line and load so that is why digital control comes into picture here with analog control it is not so easy to provide a lot of uh, leeway or a lot of adjustment in the dead time that we have provided some controllers some analog controllers do have the feature of providing adaptive dead time but the digital controller clearly wins hands down here because in digital controller we can always predict and we can always control the dead time dynamically depending on the instantaneous load condition this is one major advantage that we have uh, using digital control the flexibility of adjustable and continuously adaptive dead time which greatly enhances the efficiency over standard techniques and then we have to also provide interlocking functions like i mentioned here interlocking functions provide accidental turn on of wrong mosfets so only in the full bridge case only the diagonal mosfet should conduct while in the half bridge case only the top and the bottom mosfet should conduct one at the one at a time so these violations so that they don't occur so there is a lot of interlocking functions meant uh, to uh, provide catastrophic failures then we have the feedback management so what feedback do we need if it's a constant voltage converter we need a voltage feedback if it's a constant current converter like in the case of led lighting we need a current feedback so basically it's an error amplifier and depending on whether it's a voltage mode control or it's a current mode control it's a slow system or a fast system we need to provide either a type 1 or a type 2 or a type 3 compensator and a error amplifier eventually we also need to um, uh, discuss a bit about stability now stability is also a function of or rather the transient response and stability is a function of each other so if the system is too stable for example the system will be very slow if the system is very fast the system might not be stable so we have to find a break even we need to find we need to find a compromise we need to find an optimal point an optimal bandwidth in which the system operates so that we have an acceptable stability acceptable ringing acceptable over or undershoot as well as unconditional stability at the same time and eventually we have to provide a lot of protections like i had also mentioned earlier like startup management operating zones for example it is it is a disaster if we by any chance uh, my system moves into capacitive zone of operation in an llc converter that is not permissible and the anti capacitive region for example uh, which is basically beyond the capacitive region so this is a protection that has come into picture in recent controllers and this prevents the llc converter from entering the destructive capacitive region and eventually we have uh, we have to also provide the functional protections inherent to the topology for example uh, we have to provide for short circuit protections we have to provide for reverse voltage reverse reverse polarity protection we have to we have to provide for sudden load disconnections like i mentioned earlier these protections must also be provided if it is uh, to be made unconditionally stable 
uh, and a system that doesn't fail when it is operating under harsh conditions. Thermal management also plays a very key role and often the temperature of all the heat sinks are independently monitored so that if some heat sink due to an ambient temperature rise or due to abnormal operating condition if the temperature of the heat sink is increasing beyond the preset limit the power is either folded back or the power is either derated or the system is shut down again to prevent costly catastrophic failures. So now let's look at the power plant of the full bridge LLC converter. We have chosen full bridge LLC converter here but the same logic applies, the same justifications apply when we are targeting even half bridge LLC converters. We are showing you full bridge LLC converters because the demonstrations that we will show you, the actual designs that we will show you, the 2.5 kilowatt and the 6 kilowatt systems uh, uh, in the demonstrations, they are all implemented using full bridge LLC converters. So if you look at the leftmost part here, this is the edge bridge, this is the full, uh, full bridge uh, uh, MOSFETs. So the key figures of merit are we must have a very low RDS on and we must have a controlled COSS. Low RDS on ensures that your conduction losses are at the minimal, while controlled COSS, which is the output capacitance, output drain capacitance of the MOSFET, this ensures that you have ZVS over the entire operating span of your LLC converter, which has to be finalized during your design itself. So if the there are certain generations of MOSFETs, which have very controlled COSS, which means that over the production batches or production tolerances, the COSS doesn't vary much. So if the COSS is very controlled, it also means that in your production lot, when you are manufacturing 10,000, 20,000, 1 million pieces of converters, your performance as regards to efficiency or switching behavior remains uniform. Then we come to the magnetics part. In fact, the magnetics and this capacitor and the resonant choke, uh, they form what is called the tank circuit and the resonant tank eventually determines the eventual performance of the conductor uh, of the of the converter as far as the output voltage span the regulation and its efficiency is concerned the most important things to look at is the ratio of lm to lr lm here is the magnetizing inductance lr is the resonant inductance in applications that require a very low voltage excursion for example in constant voltage applications like a data center converter or a computer power supply say which is operating at only 12 volt or only 48 volt we can have an lm to lr ratio of maybe 6 8 or even 9 very high lm to lr ratios provide you with very high efficiencies and very low magnetizing currents but the drawback is you cannot have too much excursion in the operating voltage then we have to also look at operating Q. The operating Q is also a function of the reflected load resistance from the secondary, the value of the resonant capacitor, the value of the leakage inductance or the resonant inductance and the magnetizing inductance. It's a complex function, but we are, we are, able, to, we are able to figure out the optimal Q and the optimal M from, from the basic FHA, uh, the FHA derivations and we can plot some gain curves uh, like I mentioned earlier, from which you can choose the optimal region uh, in which your Q and M will lie. Then we have to also look at very carefully the proximity and fringing losses that happen within uh, the main magnetics or the main transformer. So with the improved generation of MOSFETs, we are now operating at 150, 200 kilohertz. And at these frequencies, uh, the copper losses become trivial with respect to the AC losses or the magnetic losses or the proximity and the fringing losses that are associated uh, with the core and the winding structure on the magnetics. So what, when I mean, what I mean by magnetic structure is the windings and the way the mind, windings are placed on the central limb of the magnetic core. The typical magnetic core is an E or a ETD core which has a central limb which is gapped and the area where the gap is there is a tremendous amount of flux emanating from the gap. So this flux this tremendous amount of flux basically interacts uh, with the nearby copper winding. So unless the copper winding is done in a particular fashion and unless a leads wire configuration is used, the losses can far overpower on the, uh, the normal copper conduction losses and you will see a reduction in efficiency. So these days finite element method tools and there are specific companies who are providing the services for high quality magnetics design and this can as much as you know provide you with a 1% gain in efficiency 
Magnetizing current again is a function of LM to LR ratio. Uh, but in certain cases, as I mentioned earlier, if you have to operate at a very wide output voltage range, uh, we have to invariably choose a low LM to LR ratio, in which case under certain operating points, the magnetizing current increases, providing you with somewhat lesser efficiency. But then we will see how to mitigate uh, the overall efficiency loss by using a certain scheme in the subsequent slides. This is the secondary side. Uh, we can use uh, either discrete diodes as rectifiers or we can use the synchronous rectifier scheme using four separate MOSFETs. Obviously, the bottom scheme is much more complicated, but the top scheme is used for either low voltage moderate current applications up to 40 amps or high voltage low to moderate current applications up to 15, 16 amps in which we are using either Schottky diodes for up to 200 volt application or silicon carbide diodes up to 1000 volt applications. So both Schottky and silicon carbide Schottky diodes have zero recovery, which greatly helps in increasing the efficiency when the converter is operating away from resonance, especially when it is operating into the deep inductive region. The key figures of merit for these rectifiers are very low forward voltage drop, which is very intuitive and also zero recovery. There will be some charge in the junk stored in the junction of these diodes, but it is mostly capacitive charge. And this one has no effect whether it is working on higher temperatures at higher, higher commutation rates or at higher frequencies. So it is only it is only the capacitive loss due to the junction that comes in, which is only a few milliwatts compared to the few watts that would have happened if the recovery time was not zero. The bottom scheme of synchronous MOSFETs of synchronous rectification is used in applications where low voltage and high current are involved. For example, if you are targeting a 5 kilowatt converter at 48 volts, that means you need to have a 100 ampere of uh, average rectified current, which is not possible to be handled uh, with high efficiency using discrete rectifiers. In those cases, we use high current MOSFETs, uh, which are very low on resistance as rectifiers. And a separate separate controller called the synchronous rectifier controller is used. It is either a separate analog IC or it is managed by firmware or software inside the microcontroller in the case of digital applications. Here also we have to judiciously apply this scheme because the most common way to use this is up to 10-15% of the rated full load. It is the body diode of the MOSFETs which conduct and when the load exceeds this lower threshold, then only the MOSFETs come into picture to provide a much more reliable operation over the entire load line. Let us look at one analog modulator and one of the most common modulators that ST offers is the L6699 controller. It is a half bridge LLC controller, but you can also always connect an external uh, gate driver to basically drive also a full bridge. Uh, here, like I mentioned, this contains all the blocks of a modulator. Here you can see at the bottom left, there is the VCO. Then you can see uh, there are error amplifiers inside. You can also see there is a bootstrap and a gate driver stage, uh, which is able to drive MOSFETs with a DC bus up to 600 volts. Then you have the interlocking logic. Then you have certain protection outputs like signals for stopping the PFC. Then you have a proprietary block uh, which takes care of additional protection functions like not entering the capacitive zone or something that also handles the overcurrent the overcurrent protection or something that also helps you to go into standby mode when you're operating at very light loads. So I suggest that if you have to have a very deep understanding of how typical analog uh, modulators for LLC controllers work, uh, you, you should you should have a look. You can have a look at the L6699 data sheet available on the ST website and here all the major building blocks for a very robust and a stable but fully analog implementation of a LLC converter up to 2 kilowatts or even 3 kilowatts can be realized using the L6699. When we show you the demo later on the 2.5 kilowatt system this is what we have done we have used another variant of the L6699 which is called the L6599 which essentially contains most of these functions uh, we have used this device in addition with the microcontroller to provide a CV and a CC loop to design the 2500 watt light electric vehicle battery charger. So we have used this and with some tricks and some added logic, we have used a mix of microcontroller and the analog modulator to realize a 2.5 kilowatt converter.
Now let us look at a digital modulator implementation scheme which will use a microcontroller to do similar functions like the L6599 or the L6699 controller that I described in the last slide. So here you can see it is the same block diagram. So here is the full bridge power plant. Here is the magnetics. Here is the secondary side uh, synchronous rectification stage. So what is joining these stages logically is the STM32 IC or the microcontroller which provides all the modulating signals that are required for the primary side and for the secondary side. It also contains all the building blocks, all the ADCs and all the sampling systems required for taking a sample of the input voltage, taking a sample of the input current, taking a sample of the output voltage, taking a sample of the output current and basically using calculations in the, the, the core inside to calculate the suitable frequency and the suitable dead time required to run this power plant in the most optimal fashion. So here you see I have added a great deal of flexibility. For example, if I want to try uh, with a different frequency, if I want to try a different modulation scheme, if I want to try and stop the system at a particular operating point, it is not so easy to do that or implement that on analog control. But here I can easily assign a breakpoint like you have seen in the MCU in the MCU course. For example, if you want to halt the system and operate the and see the operation operational behavior of the power plant at a particular point, I can stop. I can observe, I can make changes on the fly and have a reliable system operating in no time. This is not possible unless you make a significant amount of component changes, which means soldering and desoldering new components uh, in the process. Errors might happen in the process, you know, short circuits and solder bridges might happen in the PCB. So all that things we have avoided. So once you have validated this entire power plant and once your system has started working in open loop, you can keep on building up your code just by changing the firmware here with having to do no changes in the related hardware. So this is one big advantage, the advantage of flexibility and the advantage of trying out novel topologies and novel, novel control techniques without spending much time on designing the analog, the analog controller block uh, which was shown in the previous slides. So here, once the hardware is ready, only the software changes will allow you to achieve what you are trying to do at a minimal time. So let us have a look at the feedback loop that is typically used in both analog and digital controllers. In analog systems, um, the industry uses mostly a variant of this scheme that I have shown here. Uh, this scheme that I have shown here is based around the TL431 controller, uh, which works very nicely as a type 2 or a type 3 or even a type 1 compensator. Uh, realization using discrete op amps is also possible and depending on whether you want to do only constant voltage or only constant current or constant voltage constant current you would need either one or you would need uh, another one uh, error amplifier to address both voltage and current but usually the voltage and current samples or the feedback is taken from the secondary side which is the isolated side which means that the user the end user or a human being might have access to the output terminals so that means if I have to transfer uh, the signal from the isolated side to the error amplifier or to the modulator which is on the main side, I cannot have a galvanic connection. So that means I have to use an optocoupler in its linear region to transfer the error amplification signal or the feedback signal from the primary to the secondary or vice versa. But the problem is while we understand the behavior of the system very well, it is also quite popular. It is also a big drawback that the linearity of the optocoupler depends on its age. So as the age of the optocoupler increases, as the operating hours of the optocoupler increases, its linearity degrades. And there is something called the current transfer ratio of the optocoupler, uh, which also becomes unpredictable over a period of time. So that means your control loop itself would become unstable after several years of operation. So when you are building high reliability systems, uh, optocouplers are not the most popular choice. It's a simple choice, but it might not be the most reliable choice. The implementation again of the control loop is fully hardware dependent. For example, if I want to change from type 2 to type 3 or type 3 to type 1, if I want to introduce one more pole or insert one more zero, it is not so possible to do uh, so easily possible unless you are adding external hardware components and often it might see it might seem 
uh, that there is a space constraint in the existing PCB that we cannot add any more components. So this means for this design, while it is very flexible, while it is very simple to understand, while it is widely popular, any change needs a change in the hardware and it might not be always possible to do the testing on the fly or to do the testing instantaneously. These drawbacks has been removed entirely by the market evolving to digital control. So here I have shown the block diagram of a basic digital control. So digital loop comes in two forms. One is a digital analog control. That means if I am implementing a type 1 compensator or a type 2 compensator here, it's also possible to do in code. We can involve, we can, we can do a P or a PI or a PID control entirely in code. We can implement a type 1, type 2 or a type 3 compensator equivalent. Or we can also implement fully digital control like the 3 pole 3 zero scheme that we have shown here. So that's entirely in digital domain. It is quite mathematics heavy. But it is very compact and entirely code driven. So once we have understood, once the system has become popular, like in the lectures that we have seen uh, over the last uh, few weeks, uh, the actual implementation once understood provides you with an amount of flexibility that is unprecedented. It is very easy to experiment and there are multiple strategies that is possible to implement on the fly. The flexibility and the compactness is one single USP and like I have shown here, in most cases, it is one single control card which is used in multiple systems. For example, you can have this, you can have a wide lineup of products, but all your products will have a universal control card in which only you need to provide the proper code for the proper, for the particular uh, product that you are trying to put out in the market or put into production. So this flexibility is something that is completely uh, new. Uh, the market is evolving and we are striving to make digital control as easy to understand for mass manufacturers as possible. Now, once we have done uh, the design of the other three parts, it is also very important to look at the protection schemes, like I had mentioned in the first slides. The startup sequencing and preventing of entering the anti-capacitive region operation, either during startup or during operation, is very important. We must also take care of runtime overcurrent overload and short circuit effects that can happen. These are very common things to happen. And often when this happens, uh, it is not the, the heat dissipation that causes failure. It, of, it is mostly because of entering into the capacitive region. Because when you are causing an overload or when you are causing an overcurrent, the, the, operating, the operating frequency tries to shift to the left hand side of resonance to maintain regulation, which becomes very detrimental to the uh, reliability of the converter. Many times due to component aging or due to shock or whatever, uh, the feedback loop might become open. When the feedback loop becomes open, there is no control on the power plant. So this is some fallback system that must be taken care of. System level protections that must be provided are over temperature protections, over voltage protection, sudden load disconnections, etc. So these things can be taken care of either using discrete analog uh, circuitry using op amps and BJTs and comparators and uh, uh, discrete gates. You could also implement this in uh, digital domain. Uh, you can, uh, we can implement these on a microcontroller which would also function as the housekeeper. Uh, in the form of interrupts or event driven digital formats. For example, we could we could connect the temperature sensors to the various ADC channels which have been uh, which, which have been configured as uh, ADC interrupts. For example, if the temperature rises to a certain level, uh, the, the, the uh, NTC thermistor of the temperature sensor provides you with a voltage above the threshold that has been programmed and you are able to generate an ADC interrupt which will tell the MCU that over temperature condition has happened and the MCU can take steps in either cutting down the output power or shutting down the system to prevent a catastrophic failure. So all these sort of protections must also be built in into a reliable controller and once you have a system MCU in place, so it's only a matter of writing a few lines of code to implement as many channels or as many new forms of uh, protection you want to put. For example, you could add five sensors, you could add four fans, you could add uh, two, three relays to disconnect your system. It's only a matter of implementation and writing a few lines of code to whatever extra features you want to add in real time. That We have finalized or we have seen how the overall system blocks operate in a LLC converter. It is very important now to understand uh, how to choose uh, the resonant tank for a particular LLC converter operation. 
for example if your llc converter like i mentioned before if it's of a narrow range for example if it has to supply only 12 volt or only 48 volt or only 72 volts then you must keep the lm to lr ratio on a higher side while on the other hand if you have to work at a very wide span of output voltage for example 1.5 1.6 times span for example in the particular case that we are going to show you uh, in that case we have a battery charger which provides an output from 40 to 60 volts from an input bus of 400 volts which comes from a pfc controller so that means here even if the input is constant the output must, must change over a span of 1 is to 1.5 that is from 40 to 60 volts so what we have done is we have chosen a very low value of m which allows the controller or the converter to operate in this region to operate in this region to achieve maximal control yet not lose efficiency because if my if i am operating close to resonance i am operating at a much higher operating uh, at a much higher operating efficiency region on the other hand if i have chosen a larger m for example i would have to operate over such a large span see over a span of two two and a half times i would have had to operate that would mean i would have lost efficiency on the lower voltage side which is the which is the case when the battery is most discharged and is demanding most current so this gain curve allows you to choose which operating point you would operate on and you have to do a few iterations and you have to also plot the actual region so that under worst cases you can set a lower limit of your operating frequency so that you never enter the capacitive region which is the most detrimental mode of operation for llc converter so it is very important to plot these gain curves from the fha analysis equations and you can choose to operate on the steep region or a moderately steep region or you could choose to operate in the shallow region so it's entirely up to you how much how much efficiency your system needs what your target efficiency needs and how much how much control how much uh, of a uh, tight control you need over the regulation so the again this is a set of curves you can plot from the fha equations which gives you a nomograph basically what is your m which is the turns ratio uh, which is the uh, lm to lr ratio what is the operating q that you can get so from the curve you can choose that for a certain output power level and for a certain voltage span and a certain gain span this is the amount of gain and this is the amount of m that i need to provide for a certain amount of q you can go for a lower q but it is better to not to go for a higher q because if you go for a higher q you might end up losing efficient you might end up losing regulation as well as efficiency so these are the two systems that we would uh, show you later on as we progress into the sessions these are real mcu based systems these are kilowatt level power converters on the left hand side you can see a 2500 watt uh, light electric vehicle charger which provides an output of 40 to 60 volts and the maximum power of, uh, maximum current output is uh, 42 amperes which makes it 2500 watts and uh, on the right hand side you see we have a 6000 watt 6 kilowatt wide output range uh, llc converter it is just an llc converter so that means it has to be fed 800 volts dc from a, a pfc and the output which is meant to basically charge uh, electric vehicles ranges from 200 to 1000 volts so you can see that we have addressed an operating voltage span of five times so from 200 up to 1000 volt it's a 5 is to 1 span on an llc converter this is fully digital and we will also see the details of its tank parameters the simulation results and how it matches the simulation and the uh, real life uh, operation figures similarly we have done here here you can see uh, this is a full design this is an integrated design which contains both the pfc and the llc stage here the llc stage is on the right hand side we will show you more details so this again is operating in a span of uh, 1.5 so from 40 volts up to 60 volts it is able to operate from and we will see that the efficiency is in the range of 93.5 uh, percent plus uh, that is end to end efficiency not the only the llc stage the only llc stage efficiency is close to 96.5 percent uh, which is very good and it has been done uh, by judiciously choosing the active devices the output rectifier and a very careful design of the magnetics so this is a closer look at the charger that i just mentioned in the previous slide 
it's a multi it's a, it's a multi chemistry battery charger so basically it can charge lithium ion batteries it can charge uh, lead acid batteries it can charge nickel metal hydride batteries the good part is you don't uh, you don't need to have separate hardware for separate uh, battery chemistries it's only a matter of code uh, because the fundamental function of the system that is to transfer power is constant what is changing is the charging profile of the different battery chemistries the lead acid batteries would have a different uh, charging mechanism the lead acid batteries would have another sort of charging mechanisms uh, the uh, nickel metal hydride would have another sort of charging mechanism all these charging profiles are possible to be changed in a matter of minutes by doing a very small change in the code of the resident microcontroller so what we would like to highlight here is the hardware is ready so you have information of the input voltage of the output voltage of the output current all you need to do is process this information after due communication from the battery and tell the power plant how to behave depending on what the demand from the mcu is or from the battery is for example if the battery is deep discharged let us consider the case of a lead acid battery of 48 volts which has been deeply discharged so that means a deep discharge lead acid battery might be it is at 44 volts a deep discharge battery is never supplied with full power we do a trickle charge so my system knows that if the battery is a lead acid battery and it has reached 44 volts that means it is very deeply discharged so i must pump only a few amperes of current to slowly revive the battery as the battery starts slowly reviving i reach about 50 volts which i now mean that the battery has is trying to relieve itself the battery is recovering and when it has reached 50 volts i can now take the decision that my power plant must supply with the full 40 amperes required to charge it in boost mode so these decisions are a matter of setting the correct parameters in the code the entire power plant behaves as per the command sent by the microcontroller so the microcontroller gets its information from the output voltage and the current sampler which we mentioned in the block diagram and depending on that it's only a matter of fine tuning the code whether you want to charge a lead acid or a lithium ion or a, any sort of battery chemistry that you choose to so this is implemented using a ccm pfc and a full bridge llc and it is able to take 110 or 230 volts in and a very wide output 40 to 60 volt out that means it can cater to 48 volts battery of any chemistry again ranging from 40 volts up to a maximum of 60 volts this by changing the turns ratio of the transformer in a different design can be modified for 36 volts or 72 volts it has a peak efficiency of 93.5 percent uh, end to end with a very high power factor of 0.99 in most of the conditions and a thd of less than five percent at nominal power so it also has CAN and RS-485 interface for remote configuration and has comprehensive protection. So you see protections is something that any end product should have as a basic uh, feature to prevent expensive repairs or warranty claims from, from, from the field. This is the top view of the same converter on the left hand side from the middle part of the board. The left hand side is the PFC stage. Uh, this is the right hand side which is the LLC stage. So these are the two heat sinks where the bridge MOSFETs are um, connected. We have used a special package of MOSFET for this. We have not used a standard leaded TO247 or a TO220 package. Instead, we have used a surface mount package. And we will see in the later slide that the efficiency is so high that a very small heat sink is enough to dissipate all the heat. And we will see that the temperature rise of the silicon die has risen by only a few degrees above ambient, which means it is a very high efficiency converter. This is the main transformer. And this is the resonant inductor which we have kept separate the ratio of these two is 1 is to 4 so this is around 45 micro henries this is around 180 micro henries the biggest heat sink here is that of the output rectifier diodes because that is what carries the highest amount of current close to 42 amperes at full load and this means uh, uh, multiplied by the diode drop of close to 1 volt uh, this will have the highest loss component these are the output filter capacitors which are special very low ESR types because the output ripple current must be handled by these capacitors and these blue capacitors here these are the very high quality uh, resonant capacitors these must be very carefully chosen if you have to have a very high reliability product that you release to the market 
understand the hybrid or the mixed analog plus digital control scheme. So in, in a nutshell, uh, the overall controller is realized in this fashion. So there is this full bridge stage, uh, which, which gets its uh, pulse frequency modulated signal from the controller, like I explained earlier, the L6599 um, the controller. On the secondary side, we have the two rectifiers from which it is fed to the load. And we have samples of the output voltage and current, which comes to the STM32 uh, microcontroller, as well as via the error amplifier to the L6599 IC. So by default, what happens is it, when, when the system is started, it starts at a very low voltage of say 40 volts. Now what happens is if my demand from the battery is say 50 volts, I cannot pump current into the battery because my system has started up at 40 volts. So what happens is instead of changing any other operating parameter, let us have a look at the right hand side error amplifier. Any standard converter would have a modulator here in this dotted line and they would have an error amplifier. An error amplifier has two inputs. One is the output sample through a voltage divider and the other is a reference. So I can change the output voltage either by changing the ratio of the resistors, which means a physical change in hardware has to be done. Either I have to change, I have to increase the upper resistor or I have to decrease the lower resistor. Or what I can do in software is I can use, <coughs> excuse me, another tertiary PWM from the STM32, which I low pass filter and obtain a DC, or I can use a DAC, a digital to analog converter and override the reference of the error amplifier with this additional DC voltage. So what I will do is, suppose the error amplifier reference voltage is one volt. Corresponding to one volt, it provides you with an output of 40 volts. And believe, and let us assume that it's linear. So at 1.1 volt, it would provide me 44 volts. At 1.2 volt, it would provide me 48 volts like that. So I need 50 volts. So that means I need something around 1.25 volts. So what I will do is I will ramp up my PWM at the same time, keep on reading my output voltage sample till it reaches 1.25 volts. So that is my set point. So I have changed the output voltage without basically changing any hardware parameter. Instead, I have just played with the reference. Output voltage is a function of the reference voltage into the error amplifier transfer gain given by the ratio of the resistors. So I have kept, kept the ratio of the resistors constant, but I have only played upon the reference voltage dynamically. So that means I have used a tertiary PWM followed by a RC low pass filter to average the PWM into its equivalent average DC value which modulates the voltage reference to provide me with the required voltage. So basically this becomes a programmable power supply from the lowest to the maximum output provided by changing a tertiary PWM which modulates the reference of the error amplifier of the analog modulator. So this is why it is called hybrid because at the core if I remove even the tertiary PWM or if I remove even the microcontroller, the power plant would still keep on running but provide me with only 40, 40 volts of voltage. If I need more voltage, I need to provide the reference or the reference of the error amplifier with a more voltage beyond 1 volt to reach my set point. So here you can see using this same scheme, we have the end results of the LLC converter part of the battery charger. So at 2.5 kilowatts, you can see it's, it's running at very high efficiencies. At light loads, the efficiency is more than 93%. At very high load, the efficiency touches almost 97%. And it is always more than 96% under all load conditions. So for different regions of operation, we have shown for 60 volt operation, for 40 volt operation, which is the other extreme, and a nominal operation at 52 volt, which is a natural voltage for a, which is a natural voltage for a 48 volt system. You can see the output regulation; it's very tight output regulation. So nominal is the nominal, and the two other extremes vary within less than 0.1 percent. So extremely tight load regulation and extremely high efficiency, both are possible by using this hybrid control without sacrificing anything. We have the flexibility of changing on the fly uh, the battery charging parameters yet we have a very easy implementation easy less time consuming implementation of the power plant by using the analog control blocks 
so it's a happy marriage of partially analog and partially digital control to achieve a high performance charging solution you can see the 2.5 kilowatt converter uh, thermal map so this is the heat sink of uh, the llc mosfets you can see we have we, have, we call this package the toll package it is not the standard um, to247 or to220 through hole packages that you are aware of you can see that if you look at from this nomograph the maximum temperature is reached somewhere in the transformer and in the pcb traces while the main mosfets is actually cold so the temperature is in the 30s so this proves that it, how highly efficient the llc converter can be in fact most of the heating is actually happening in the magnetics and in the pcb copper trace so we have used a pcb which is of 130 degree centigrade class and here also you can see that the heat sink of the diode output rectifier that also is not very hot so that's in the range of around uh, uh, 60 65 degrees which is very much within the operating margin so now that we have gone through the slides it is time for the practical demo session so i will walk you through the lab uh, where we have set up uh, the 2500 watt light electric vehicle charger uh, based on the hybrid control that i mentioned so these are the two boards that we have kept here one board has been actually wired uh, to the measurement setup one board is here to show you a close up but before that let me walk you through the instruments that we are using here we have the chroma 15 kilowatt uh, power source it's a regulated ac power source it's a three phase power source but it is uh, now wired uh, for 230 volt single phase as you can see here this is a calibrated instrument so all readings coming from here the voltage the current the power factor the phase angle everything is absolutely accurate here we have basically the input side power analyzer again this is a calibrated instrument this measures the input voltage the input current the input thd the current thd and the input power factor this is one of the boards that i would like to show you in close up so on the left hand side you can see the fan which is used to cool the board it's a 65 cfm fan and the air draft is sufficient to cool the hard switched pfc stage and the very soft switched highly efficient llc stage so here we have the close up of the llc stage these two are the bulk capacitors which are actually the output capacitors of the pfc these two heat sinks mount the toll package smd package uh, power mosfet which is of the full bridge this is the main transformer this is the llc transformer this is the llc inductor the resonant inductor uh, this heat sink houses the uh, the output rectifiers the output short key rectifiers here you can see these are the output bulk capacitors and here you can see the surface mount devices those are the power mosfets four power mosfets are used in the bridge configuration and it delivers a total power of 2500 watts i request my colleague to kindly put away this board from here so this is the actual board that we have connected so these are differential probes a very high performance differential probes with very high common mode rejection ratio and uh, here we have the current probe the current probe is used to measure the resonant current you can see the same board at the output of the board we have connected the yokogawa uh, power analyzer again this is used to measure the output dc voltage and current and this is the 6 kilowatt active load this has been configured now for 5 amperes and uh, this we will also use to step the load from 5 amperes to 25 amperes and back again to 5 amperes to demonstrate to you the transient response of the converter so if you now watch closely on the oscilloscope i am asking my colleague to turn on the system it will take a bit of time because there is a short start routine involved and an inrush current routine involved so kindly observe so you can see that the system has started in soft start it has not abruptly started so here you can observe the two gate drives you see there is absolutely no miller plateau on the gate drives which means it's running in zvs and also this kink 
the slight downward kink on both the sides implies that it is in full ZVS. So it is working under slightly above the resonance zone. At resonance, its voltage is around 54 volts. But at the moment, we have tuned the voltage to 48 volt, as you can see here, and the current is around 5 amperes. So now I will ask my colleague to increase the current of this system to 25 amperes. So we are doing a slow roll so that you can see the actual transient response happening. You can see it has shot up, we have shot the load from 5 amperes to 25 amperes. There was absolutely no overshoot and now he will again cycle the load from 25 amperes down to 5 amperes. Again you can see it has recovered very quickly. Because this is a battery charger application, we don't really need a very fast transient response. Uh, we have a moderately fast loop, but you can see there is no absolutely overshoot or undershoot in the resonant current waveform. So now it is running at 5 amps. I would ask my colleague to once again step the current to 25 amperes. So you can see this is the resonant current. It is slightly above resonance as you can see. Now you can observe the input parameters. The input power factor is 0.998 and the input THD is 4.3% while the output is at 48.6 volts and 25 amperes at 1.2205 kilowatts. So if you note the output and if you note the input and if you calculate the input power by output power, you will find that the efficiency is close to 94%. We will now show you the most important part of the control, which is the hybrid control. So the hybrid control, like I mentioned, uses a tertiary PWM from the MCU to modulate the reference of the analog controller. So basically what we will do is, at 48 volts, we need a very small duty cycle. We need a very small duty cycle of around 1%, as you can see here, very narrow spikes to basically arrive at 48 volts. Now my colleague will in increase the value of this tertiary PWM so that it, the output voltage increases. So before that, let us quickly make a note of what the output voltage now is under this condition. So the output voltage is now 48.6. So my colleague will now change or emulate the change in the tertiary frequency. You can see now that the tertiary PWM duty cycle has increased so we have stopped it for your convenience we can now see that the voltage has increased to around 51 volts we will do a one more step jump you can see that the voltage will jump to 54 volts you see this tertiary PWM frequency has increased even further so now it is at around 54.5 volts. So let's do the reverse way. Now we will decrease the tertiary PWM. You can see the tertiary PWM has decreased. So as the output voltage, again it has come down to 50.7, which is around 51 volts. We will further decrease the tertiary PWM to very narrow. And you can see that the output voltage has again come back to 48.5 volts. So essentially, by changing the tertiary PWM, we can change the output current or the output voltage depending on what sort of information the master controller receives from the battery BMS. So this completes the live demo session of the hybrid control 2.5 kilowatt light electric vehicle charger. I hope you are able to pay attention and observe the function and the important waveforms of this board in question. So hope you are able to carefully observe the practical sessions and uh, uh, all the waveforms and all the operating modes that we have shown you in the in the, in the live lab session. So in a nutshell, in this lecture, uh, we have tried to show that the LLC converter overview uh, we have we have covered uh, with respect to the power plant, with respect to the modulator, with respect to the uh, protection schemes and the feedback management. Uh, we have also demonstrated to you uh, the 2.5 kilowatt light electric vehicle charging system. 
the performance results we have shown with you and we have explained in detail uh, with, with the live uh, demonstration. In the next upcoming lecture, uh, we will show you uh, the wide output range 6 kilowatt converter, which is a fully digital implementation. Again, uh, we will show you, we will walk you through uh, the actual live session on the actual board that has been developed here in Noida. And uh, we hope uh, you will find that also enjoyable. Thank you for being patient and for observing uh, and for watching the episode. I hope uh, it helps you in designing of your own LLC converters.